everyone! Since you're in the comfort of your own homes, listening to this online science forum instead of being at the lecture hall of the College of Development and Communication, we are indeed learning in difficult times. But learn we must and learn we shall. This science forum entitled Pagmatiyag, a multidisciplinary discussion on epidemiology in the time of COVID-19 was designed to deepen our understanding and appreciation of epidemiology and its role in decision making and taking action for public health. Three panelists will lead our discussion, Dr. Enrique A. Tayag, from the perspective of public health, Dr. Emmanuel M. Luna from the social science standpoint and Dr. Jomar M. Trabahante from the data science and mathematical modeling perspective. We hope that this discussion will allow us to recognize that now more than ever we have to work together and now more than ever we must communicate science. I would like to congratulate the Department of Science Communication led by its Chair, Assistant Professor Elaine Liarena for spearheading this event. I also express my deepest thanks to the faculty and staff of the College of Development Communication who helped organize this event. So again, welcome to this year's first science So now, um, I'll just give a brief, brief background of what the webinar is all about. So we at the Department of Science or uh, Science Communication organized this science forum um, entitled Pagmamatiag, a multidisciplinary discussion on epidemiology in the time of COVID-19 because we wanted um, to further promote um, understanding and appreciation um, of the field of, ep of epidemiology, especially during this time of COVID-19 pandemic. So you know that we, uh, we are aware that we are bombarded with a lot of information nowadays and uh, about the disease, about the number of cases um, here in our country and globally, and even um, with the current situation, the new normal that we are already in right now. So, we know that oftentimes with this information that we have, um, we get just bits of information of these pieces of information that may sometimes lead us to uh, misinformation, distru distrust, and even misguided actions. So we hope that this um, science forum will encourage us to acknowledge the different facets of the field of, ep of epidemiology and the relevance of different disciplines, which we will be um, be featuring um, in the which will be featured by three of our guest panelists for this afternoon. These disciplines that we want us to appreciate also that would provide solutions in battling against COVID-19 pandemic. So we are fortunate to have our three guest speakers this afternoon who will share their expertise and insights with us. So let me introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker is Dr. Enrique Tayag or um, Doc Eric. So Doc Eric is currently the Director for in the Department of Health at the Knowledge Management and Information Technology service. He is a physician by profession and has held key positions in the Department of Health in the past 30 years of his service. He has focused his career in public health, particularly infectious diseases, epidemiology, health promotion, health systems, and universal health care. He has acted as OIC Assistant Secretary of Health from years 20, 2010 to 2015 he has published several scientific articles in infectious diseases 
and is a much sought speaker on numerous topics in medicine and public health. He remains popular in media even after his assignment as the DOH spokesperson. He remains as TV host in PTV4's weekend medical program, The Doctor is In. He remains affiliated with various non-governmental associations such as the Philippine Medical Association, the Philippine Society of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, Philippine Foundation for Vaccination, South Asia Field Epidemiology and Technology Network, and the Rotary Club of Manila. Many of us know him as he is dubbed as the DOH Dancing Doctor because of his pension for dancing in public as he espouses on healthy lifestyle and disease prevention. So without further ado, let us now listen to Dr. Eric Tayad. Hello, good afternoon everyone and uh, thank you Elaine and thank you for the invitations for this uh, webinar. And let's unfold the mystery behind the science of epidemiology. As your first presenter, I'm going to talk about epidemiology in public health and focusing on surveillance protocols and field experiences in the light of COVID-19. Epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of health states in human pumps. It is a data-driven science wherein probability statistics and research methods play a big part for causal relationships and causal inference that we need. So we ask the question, why? 18 weeks after the World Health Organization announced and declared that the COVID-19 is a public health emergency of international concern, they have reported now over 7 million cases and over 400,000 deaths, a case fatality rate of 5.7%. In this map, which is color-coded, those which are darkly colored will have the most number of cases reported on a running seven-day average. Next, please. In the Philippines, while this slide shows you the total number of 21,895, yesterday it has tipped to 22,192 with 1,017 deaths. And how do we compare with our case fatality? In the Philippines, it's 4.4% against the global average of 5.7%. In this slide, we show you also the number of healthcare workers that have been reported as confirmed COVID-19 cases. This slide shows you all the numbers you want to know. This is available in the Department of Health website, but exactly how did we get these numbers? Next slide, please. Surveillance and response. They go together, they cannot be separate. On the left side of the screen, the Department of Health since 1988 was able to establish a case-based surveillance, an event-based surveillance, and laboratory-based surveillance. Case-based surveillance counts the number of cases based on a list which have been dubbed as the notifiable diseases in the country. So there's regular reporting of these cases compared to the other surveillance systems that we have, which is event-based surveillance wherein we report clusters or outbreaks and the sources of information will include the media, the newspapers, the radio, even social media. So we scar for all those information posted in social media or announced by the media so that we're able to make sure that the information we get complements those that we're able to gather using the case-based surveillance system. The laboratory-based surveillance system, the unit of reporting is based on the sample entrants that are 
examined. And so therefore, the three surveillance systems are complementary to each other. And that is how we collect data on a regular basis. So surveillance is our first line of defense. How else can we know what's happening if we don't know or recognize those events, identify cases, or even identify pathogens that are lurking just in our environment, and therefore we have to detect them, report them, so we can do something about them. And what is doing something about them? That's the response. For COVID-19, the initial response was suppression so that we can eliminate it as fast as we can. Eliminate the SARS-CoV-2 or limit its spread by doing containment. And so we need information how we can contain. And then there is mitigation. If we cannot be successful, at our measures in containment and suppression, then we should follow through with mitigation or a combination of any of these three. So there's always surveillance and it cannot stand alone without the response. Next slide, please. Now regarding protocols, how does the Department of Health announce these protocols or procedures to guide all key players so that the implementation of surveillance or even how to respond or cope with the COVID-19 pandemic, it's actually making sure that we have standards. But because the knowledge of what we have on the virus and the disease itself changes as it evolves so there is what we call interim protocols so these interim protocols require the quick identification of cases based on a preliminary case definitions so remember we had the persons under monitoring persons uh, under uh, investigation and so we decided to report this earlier in the pandemic in the country, and we require confirmation of these cases in the laboratory tests. That is very standard that is required because we do not want apples and oranges when we report these cases. And of course, we started with line listing these cases and that this was facility based. Over time, we had to update the protocols as new information became available. And uh, cautiously, we wanted to cast a wider net. And so therefore, based on the new information in the nature of COVID-19, for example, that asymptomatics or presymptomatics can actually play a big role in spreading the disease or the virus, we had to modify our protocols and we also had to modify our testing requirements. And uh, right now, newer studies focusing on prevalence studies. Next slide, please. For the response part, we have a menu here wherein everybody of us should stay home. And when we are out in public, we should wear masks. And even in the response, this has evolved. For during the start of the pandemic, the value the, the WHO just recommended that those who are sick we out the masks to choose are different from the masks that health workers should use. And of course, hand basic foundation of our public health measure, physical distancing, disinfection, all together will be our response so that we can prevent the spread of the virus. Next slide, please. 
Now we have to test, track, trace, and treat. This is our strategy. This is shared by many member states around the world. The idea is where are the cases? So we should find and look for the cases. Then we have to test each case so that we will be able to interview them if they are confirmed cases and find who were exposed to them and proceed with contact tracing and those who were probably or most, most likely exposed we have to quarantine them so we quarantine those who were exposed and we isolate those who are actually sick and when we treat these patients these are again based on protocols that were shared by countries and right now we are one of the countries that are conducting solidarity trials on five treatment arms for COVID-19. Next slide please. What can I say about uh, field experiences? So please remember that surveillance is our first line of defense. We have to know. We have to establish the nature of the enemy. We have to make sure that our protocols are evidence-based, that the laboratory tests are standards, and we are transparent in our reporting. We admit our mistakes. If there are mistakes, we correct them. Despite the uproar from the public when we commit our mistakes, we just have to correct mistakes. Nothing is perfect. And then our recommendations for the response is one which we can describe as face quarantine measures and LGU involvement is very important. But our field experiences also has some negatives. And what are these? At the very start of the pandemic, we had limited laboratory capacity. Now we have ramp up our capacity. There are still inadequate PPEs in many areas and we're trying to work so that PPEs are always available 24-7. We want to save lives, especially our frontliners. There has been limited contact tracing and we are using technology to make sure this happens fast and uh, effectively. There may have been inefficient reporting like delays or under-reporting. We are monitoring quarantine breaches and we want to make sure that human rights are not violated. Overcrowded hospitals should uh, actually cope with their situation and be able to serve as many COVID-19 cases or even non-COVID-19 cases 24 seven. Next slide, please. The lessons learned. So we know that tests can only do so much. Online tools that we're introducing should not replace what we can do now and the breach of privacy will never be acceptable and we adhere to the public and to you joining this meeting that uh, you have to give us feedback if any of those we have introduced actually breaches privacy of their privacy concerns that the every protocol is interim so you have to visit the doh website we publish this in the newspapers uh, you should be committed enough to look for new information and validate this with us. Organizing things is key. Nothing will stay permanent. It changes. It's dynamic. And please recognize that epidemiologists are frontliners too. Next, please. And of course, we have challenges. We want to predict the future. We want to make sure that technology actually supports our ambitions and we can embrace new tools in epidemiology because epidemiologists are disease detectives. We want to make sure we monitor effective countermeasures. We can do everything now, but we have to optimize resources and manage fair expectations. Next, please. So how do we go to the new normal? So first we slow down the spread, we transition on the pre-vaccine new normal. The vaccine, many say, will catapult us to the new normal. 
So it's just a matter of time or else if we fail, so we should have other options. And this is based on sound judgment, which is influenced by epidemiologic evidence. Next slide, please. We are now bracing for a whole new world. It is uncertain, but we can predict and everything is going to be figure outable. And the last slide, please. The secret, as Ram Emanuel said, you never let a serious crisis go to waste. We should learn fast and move forward. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you for that uh, presentation, Doc Eric. I really like the last um, slide that you showed us that we really have to learn from this crisis and really, um, you know, think about also to move forward, you know. And I like the way, I like how you said it that we, know, we now live in this new normal and the new normal um, should um, allow us to think about how we respond to uncertain to uncertainty because this is I think this is now part of the new normal the uncertainty of everything around us so now I think uh, it's about time now for our, our participants um, maybe we can uh, we can ask our participants if they have questions okay so um, here's the question this is for Doc Eric um, this is from Katrina Guanyo so he is, uh, she is asking Doc Eric, how does the attack rate of COVID-19 differ in more densely populated areas, so example, or such as Metro Manila, from less densely populated area? Um, then he, she has a follow-up question. Do you think the Balik, Proben Balik Probinsya program will have implications on incidents of COVID-19 in the provinces? And what do you think are the actions that can be done in order to further capacitate our public health system. Adami, Doc. So I think isa -isa po natin. Okay. Because of the nature of the virus and the illness and how it's transmitted, we should uh, understand that uh, it is person-to-person -person transmission. And so, therefore, we are gatherings. And there's evidence now, especially if it's uh, inside close spaces then spread can actually be fast because this is now considered a highly dangerous and contagious virus and so to your question what is the attack rate that is one of those studies we wanted to know but uh, basically based on prediction models okay you expect more cases or proportion of uh, cases happening in densely populated area but these are modifiable because if you stay home you wear masks when you are out in public you have the other public health measures of washing your hands so there are modifying factors that can change the or modify the attack rates in densely populated area from the less dense, uh, densely populated area. Now for the question, do you think the Balik Provincial Program will have implications on incident? Definitely there is. If we are not going to fix our quarantine procedures, then consider those who will be going back to the provinces as ambassadors of the virus. They're going to bring the virus with them especially with the new information that asymptomatics who are infected may actually transmit or spread the virus to those who are susceptible. And what actions can be done in order to further capacitate our public health system? Uh, the government needs investments in new technology. The most important thing so that uh, we can actually further capacitate uh, public health system is that we need you to join us in the Department of Health, in the health sector. We need people that, has, that we have to develop their talents and knowledge and skills because it takes a village to have 
a public health system? Thank you for those questions. So this is from Emerson Vibar, the faculty of the University of Santo Tomas. So CDC classifies cases into confirmed, probable, lab-confirmed, clinically compatible case, and epidemiological link case. Why does the DOH need to classify cases into fresh and late? And does this have, does this have clinical significance in treating and managing patients with highly infectious disease such as COVID-19. So, Doc Eric, can you please comment or answer this question? From okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Emelson. Uh, this is a misimpression because DOH has adapted world global standards on reporting cases and from the previous uh, persons under monitoring and persons under investigation, we have already updated that as i told you earlier we have interim protocols and these are updated and we have already uh, included suspected cases probable cases and confirmed cases confirmed cases can include the include those that have epidemiological linkage as you stated here and uh Confirmed cases will require laboratory confirmation. Now for the question, why does the DOH need to classify cases? Because there has been delayed reporting and backlogs on uh, validating patient information. So it works like this. So if you're a patient, you go to a health facility, samples are taken, they're sent to the laboratory. But the laboratory gets on the information on the name, the residence, the age, the gender, and then the samples, the date it was taken, the type of sample, and then you get the results. Now, to complete our epidemiological picture, we have to gather more information on that patient who was just tested. We need to know uh, the symptoms, the list of symptoms are therefore uh, validated against the person giving information so that we can have a better picture uh, and then we can have very good analytics and visualization. Now the reason why we are classifying them into fresh and late because we looked at the backlogs and so therefore uh, results that are actually available immediately uh, and therefore, they are reported as fresh, and those that have delayed uh, test results or pending results will be in the uh, late category. So it does not have any clinical significance except that we are making adjustments because of the huge backlog. In fact, if you would look at the actual number of cases, uh, there's a 5,000 difference between those who were tested positive and those that have been officially uh, reported. 